this is the second time that Kurush is here, and the last time he, he filled up the space and he entertained us and enthralled us with his talk on uh, the, the, the archaeology of food. This was about a year and a half ago on a Sunday morning, and it was just a superb, superb uh, morning for two hours. Uh, Kurush, thanks for coming. Pleasure. I don't know much about what you're going to speak today, so I'm not going to introduce the, the topic. Uh, but Kurush is um, a professor of archaeology at the University of Mumbai um, and also um, passionate about food. His, his mom ran a very famous uh, Parsi catering uh, service in Bombay for many, many years, and now Kurush, has, Kurush and his wife have continued that legacy. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. And we're planning to, over time, have a series of, uh, I'm trying to convince Kurush to come and he's, uh, he's gracefully agreed to do this, um, a series of talks, maybe once every two months, um, on, on his work on archaeology and on, the archaeolo and on food. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, the other announcement that we I want to make is that this talk is a series of talks that are being brought to us by Indigene, Indi and a new festival that is coming to Pune called the Indigene Festival. Uh, it is founded by Black Swan Journeys and Artsphere, which is an uh, Black Swan Journeys is a travel a boutique travel company, and Artsphere is a uh, space which does a lot of work in um, art therapy, dance, music, etc. And uh, Shishir kindly has brought this talk to us today. Uh, and the the, the Indigene Festival is on the seventh and eighth of October. Uh, we are the loft is associated with the festival. We are bringing one of our uh, regulars here, uh, Ankit Chadda is going to be performing at the Indigene uh, through us and uh, uh, at the end of this, uh, it's a festival that's bringing together artists, uh, craftspeople, uh, speak, uh, writers, performers, uh, I think Kurush is also going to be speaking at, at, the, yes. at, the, at the festival. Hopefully. Hopefully. And, uh, 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 one request I would like, all of you to, uh, uh, I want all of you to request uh, Kurush to come down on the 8th. Initially the plan was he would come down on the 7th, uh, but 8th probably he may or may not be able to come in. But towards the end of the talk, I'm sure we will make him agree to okay. come in on the 8th. So I've got to give you all a bad lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Kurush. So, Uh, thank you very much, Kushru, for a very kind uh, introduction. Thank you, Shishir and Kushru, for uh, having me here. And uh, I'll try my best to see that I don't completely and absolutely bore you to tears. Uh, what I've come here to talk to you about is the work of many, many people. You might just see me individually sitting here, but there are a hell of a lot of people who've been involved in this at various different levels academic, non-academic, etc., etc. The Solset Exploration Project, which I'm going to talk to you about, has been on for two years now. We started off because we realized that there was a crying need for this work. We've subsequently taken it one step further in the second season. We hope to take it, so maybe I'll come back next year and talk to you about the second season's work, but this is essentially the work that we did in the first year. Now, from 2011, when I joined the Center for Extramural Studies at the University of Mumbai, till 2015, we had a lot of students who were interested in doing, students and colleagues who were interested in doing archaeology in Bombay. Now, for those of you all who may not be comfortable with archaeology and its various nuances, there are two pillars upon which archaeology builds itself and stands. So these are explorations and excavations. Now, you can't have excavations without explorations. And excavations cost a lot of money, require a whole host of permissions, and require a certain technical expertise that is not easily available or accessible. Also, I hark back, they require a lot of money. Explorations can be done by anybody. Archaeology is not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. Anybody can do archaeology. Okay? Today, thanks to smartphones, and the kind of stuff that your smartphone can do. I mean, my smartphone is smarter than I am. I can't make it do half the things it purportedly can. But it's a good camera. It's an amazingly good map device. It gives you locations. It uses GPS. It acts as a compass. It helps you plot where you are. 
It helps you geotag your photographs. It helps you take videos. All the things that you took with you to the field, a compass, a scale, maps, a camera, film cameras, notebooks, pens, papers, graph paper, everything is now in your smartphone. Now the specific software that helps you track yourself. Okay, so that you know exactly where you went and what you did and you realize that, oops, I thought I did the entire district, but I've only done about two thirds of it and there's an entire third that I missed. So this is kind of laying the background for you. Uh, so we kept sending out a lot of our students and many of us who worked with the department, many of my colleagues who came in as teachers, as resource people, continued to do piecemeal archeological research in and around the environs of the city of Bombay. Now, I don't know if you know, but the city of Bombay is made up of two entire districts in Maharashtra called Mumbai and Mumbai Suburban. Mumbai Suburban is essentially the island of Salset. And the island of Salset is essentially everything from Bandra to Bhayandar and from modern Thana down to Sion. So all of that was an island of Salset. The seven islands that made up Bombay were not really well, didn't really amount to half as much as Salset did. And Salset was the Mumbai as such of the medieval period. So what happened was a lot of us were doing a lot of research here. A lot of our students, like I said, a lot of our colleagues. And we were being helped by various agencies. The India Study Center Trust was with us, the Sate College, students from the St. Xavier's College, students and colleagues from the Deccan College, Pune and various other people, just too many to count, have helped us in so many ways to do the kind of work that we're doing. Uh, many other people have also worked on Mumbai. It's not our private Jagir. So let me be very clear about that and be very grateful to the people who've done this. What we realized when we collated that five or six years of work between 2011 and 2015 and tried to look at it holistically was that anybody and everybody was working piecemeal. Nobody seemed to know what everybody else was doing. Nobody was really coming together and trying to flesh out, you know, different <coughs> fragments of a larger picture. Everybody was working on their data as though that was the beginning and the end. And this was achieving perhaps not even 20% of what could have been achieved by this project. So these are some of the places that we brought under the scanner in that period. So Pimpalwadi, which is in the heart of Bombay, Mahim, Parel, Mahik, uh, Mahakali and Pawai, Borivli and Iksar, Vasai and Sopara, Verli, Goregaon, which is now the infamous Ram Mandir station, Juhu, Gorai, and Mangalakali, which is a set of new caves that were discovered. Can you imagine that? The Kaneri Caves, 108 of them or whatever, are not enough. There are more caves in, in the hillsides opposite Kaneri that have never been systematically explored. So there was an enormous amount of data that just came out in this period of time. This is the famous Parel Heptad, or what is known as the Parel Shiva, often known colloquially as the Bara Devi. This is a huge late Vakataka, post Vakataka, you can argue the art historical antecedents till the cows come home, statue which is about 11 feet high. It's enormous. Uh, everybody thinks it's in the Prince of Wales Museum. The Prince of Wales Museum has a plaster cast. The original is very close to where it was actually delivered or discovered in Parel when the Hafkin Institute road was being made and sits at the Baradevi temple, uh, neatly enclosed in a grill and quietly, gently kind of mouldering away. It's a good thing it's stone. Now something like this, okay, could not have existed in isolation. So this was a question that nobody seemed to be asking. Or at least nobody was looking for the answers to this question. How could such a phenomenal piece of artisanship exist in isolation on the island of Parel? What else was happening there? Why was somebody not looking at Parel? So I spoke about this and my student Harshada, I think she's here somewhere, hiding, decided to go to Parel. And hallelujah, there was so much more at Parel that nobody ever seemed to have collated. And she presented a beautiful paper at one of our um, annual workshops that we do on explorations in Maharashtra on the other materials that were found there. So this is some of the stuff that she found. So this is a donation stone on the top, part of a stele, 
It's called the Gaivasru pillar. There's a hero stone fragment embedded in a temple over there, which you see on the right. And what you see on the left over here is actually dredged up from the pond at Hafkin Institute. Very people, few people know that Hafkin Institute used to be the governor of Bombay's bungalow. That's the main Hafkin Institute building. And this is a beautiful piece of colonial stonework that at some point ended up in the Hafkin Institute pond and then was dredged out and put at the side and kind of casually forgotten. This is what another pair of my students, Rajesh and uh, uh, Siddharth, along with Anurag, came across. So uh, ignore the lion, or rather both the lions. Okay, This is plaster, and so is this one. Ignore the two lions. What you're seeing over here is actually the top of a pillar. These are bharvakas, okay? all of these, five of them. And they look as though they're, they're the weight-bearing parts of the pillar. So they're holding up the roof. Now, interestingly, it's also, they're also called kichakas sometimes. One means that there was one extension on the top. Two of them means there were extensions on two sides. Three of them means there were three beams sitting on it. Four of them would mean four. Five. Five was odd. Okay? And this is now worshipped as Amba Mata. And you can see the sari draped to Amba Mata. We were, of course, completely politically incorrect and disrobed Amba Mata so that we could photograph her. Uh, we, were, we were good and we robed her back before we left. So this, uh, so we did a little bit of work and we realized that this kind of a pillar capital could only exist in a temple which had an octagonal mandapa in front of the Garbhagriha. So we compared this to the two octagonal mandapas of the Shilara period that we have at Ambarnath and at Lonar and realized that it is more ornate, more elaborate and larger than both of them. So this one unit of a temple could help us reconstruct an entire temple. So this had come up intact during excavations that were being carried out next door in the Johnson compound to build a building and the Chokidar put it up so that he could make a little money on the side by becoming a Babaji and having a temple. It's a very honest uh, and lucrative occupation in India. <laughs> this is some of the other stuff from Mahim. So this is the famous uh, Mahim stupa, okay, which was discovered and which uh, kids now play cricket next to. One of these days, bits of it are going to fall off. And uh, it's really weird because it is the left hand of the image that is in Abhay Mudra and not the right hand as it should be. And Dr. Jamkhedkar has written a paper on this, believes that it is quite late and people have more or less forgotten the correct iconography by the time this was made. This is something that we found at the Shitla Devi temple premises, telling us that there was a lot of stuff clustered at various different places in Mahim. So when we presented this, one of my students saw the presentation, and the next year she went to uh, the police station at Mahim for police verification, for a passport. And forgot about her police verification, and it's screaming out on the phone to me, saying, sir, sir, you've got to come down. So there was a beautiful hero stone, and three Shilahara style, or well, Shilahara Yadava style, fragments embedded at the base of each of these arcs. So one, two, three, four. The local policemen have no recollection of when they were put in. There was one gentleman who had been there for 30 years and said, ever since I have been here at this police station, they've always been there. Uh, the local constabulary has been very nice and painted them in nice chocolate paint and uh, <laughs> hidden most of their features while doing so. This is the incredibly rare representation of the wind god Vayu and that's his scarf behind him, blowing in the breeze. This is a very interesting form of Hanuman that appears in the Shilara and late Chalukya period, known as the Chapeta Hanuman, which is then uh, kind of absorbed into the Hanuman iconography of the Maratha period, okay, without knowing quite what the story is. And then the story ra radically changes, because in the Maratha period, they don't know why the iconography is the way it is. So this Hanuman image is basically a story of Hanuman entering the Ashok Vatika, and when he's leaving, the youngest son of Ravana confronts Hanuman and says, I cannot let you pass. And Hanuman says, you know, tu kalka chokra hai. Baju ho jane to watada lunga dere to. <laughs> so this kid, of course, says, I've got to do what I've got to do. And Hanuman says, then I'll have to do what I have to do. And there's one of those ridiculous, uh, you know, Mithun Chakravarti kind of scenes <laughs> happening over there from Gunda. So, well, in any case, Ananda Kumar decides to attack Hanuman. Hanuman turns around and whacks the hell out of him and kills him. So he falls down to the ground. And his wife, the boy's wife, 
and he's a little boy with the wife. Never mind that. <laughs> Begs forgiveness from Hanuman. So that is the image that you see there. You'll see a beautiful image like this at Rani Ki Wow also, of the same period. Most interesting was this. This is a typical hero stone. There's actually a little bit of writing on it here, which has nicely been painted over. Inscribed hero stones are almost unknown in Maharashtra. Almost. In Karnataka, they're scribbling all over the sides. All over wherever there's a flat bit of stone. And sometimes when there's not a flat bit of stone. Doing the same in Tamil Nadu. In Maharashtra, for some reason, pff, nothing. So what you normally have is the death of the hero. The hero ascending to heaven. And the hero having reached heaven in front of a shivling, offering his thanks over here. So there's the hero with folded arms. Here's the shivling. Here's normally a priest officiating over here. And he has reached heaven. This actually depicts a boat. So there's a ship over here, mast, and there's the hero over here. It's a death at sea. Mayim was a very important port. And this is evidence of the port of Mayim. So this is the hero stone in its entirety. This is the famous, now infamous Vayu from Mahim. Sandeep Daisargar was killing some time in Goregaon and well, there's a Kichaka here. There's a beautiful Jata Mukuta bearing Shiva over here. With a lovely crescent in the center of his Jatas, not on the side. A couple of sling balls and the base of a uh, Asker stone or what is called a Gadegal. This is another Gadegal and here I think uh, it's a little obvious as to exactly what is happening. This is a land grant inscription. This is this, the moon and the sun, Achandra Surya Viraje, as long as the moon and sun shall remain. This is the inscription telling you about a land grant or a grant of various sorts normally, more often than not a land grant. Here is the Danda, which says, I Gadede Zavize. If you do not follow that which the king says here, your mother will be forced to fornicate with a donkey. And just in case, since 90% of the people can't read in this period, there's a graphic representation, you know. So it's very much like today, emojis and things like that that we use, so that we can express things because, you know, words are too much. So, see, full circle. So these are two of the three, the, these are the two Gorai Gadegals discovered by Dr. Prachi Moge, Dr. Suraj Pandit and their team while working at Gorai and Uttan. These are the new caves from Mangalakali that were also discovered by Vinayak Parab, Suraj Pandit and Akash Pawar. They don't look like much, I know. They're not really spectacular and perhaps because of that they haven't really been recorded well. If you notice there are modern bricks over here. There used to actually be a local Babaji who had his ashram here for some time till the forest department people threw him out. <laughs> the forest department people were sure that these caves had already been numbered. The archaeological survey of India, it seems, had actually come and uh, well technically noted these caves, but nobody had bothered to publish them. So as far as we were concerned when we found them, well, they hadn't been found before. This is a very interesting boulder, this is the back of the same boulder, with a Tara image on it, not far from Mangalakali. So, we realized that there was stuff scattered all over Bombay. And nobody seemed to have done anything about it. So, we were brainstorming about this, and Professor Jamkedkar, who is kind of the doyen of our department, said, you know, there is a crying need for a systematic survey to be conducted of the archaeological remains still scattered on the ground. And we realized that they were absolutely correct. That this was something that needed to be done. And if our department was to make its bones in the field as such, this was the kind of thing that we really needed to do for the city. That if we were a city-based department, this is what we should give back to our city. Something that most archaeologists forget is that ultimately they are being paid to do their work by the government. The government supposedly, well at least we like to believe it in democracy, is the government of the people. Right? So it's the people's work that we're doing and if we don't tell the people about it, the people won't be interested in it and the people wouldn't like to sponsor any more work and then we shouldn't really complain that we don't get funds. Too bad, so sad. 
right? So, we decided that the south of Bombay was intensely built up and well, there wasn't really much left to do. But that the Salsut area was still being built up and there had been numerous archaeological works that had haphazardly once again been done. Now, I don't know how many of you all know, but the city of Mumbai has more forts than almost every single other city in the world. No city has as many forts. Maybe I'll ask Kushru someday to call me over and we'll do forts of Bombay with you all. Okay? But the city of Bombay has more caves, most definitely, than any other city in the world. Man-made rock-cut caves. We have Buddhist caves and we have Brahmanical caves. Mahakali from the 1st century BC onwards, Kaneri probably from the 1st century AD onwards, all the way to the 11th, 12th, even maybe later centuries AD. The caves at Magatne, which are going to be destroyed, definitely belonging at least to the 4th century AD, I'm told. The only caves in Bombay which are cross-referenced, because the monks from Magatne made a donation to Kaneri and left an inscription behind at Kaneri. But we're going to demolish these caves because the government feels it's more important to build cheap housing on the spot. Uh, but that's not really surprising because there was an entire hill called Padan uh, in Bombay, in between Goregaon and Malad on the Eastern Express Highway. And what's left of that entire hill is the facade of VT Station and uh, the municipal building. Padan Hill was full of caves, later Hindu caves with inscriptions and sculptures and they're all gone. So we have line drawings of the same and that's about it. Magatne is on the way and will soon be gone. Its memory will remain behind in the Magatne bus depot. And people will wonder why it's called that. There are the Jogeshwari caves, which are Brahmanical caves. And nobody seems to look for anything around the Jogeshwari caves. It's like the Jogeshwari caves existed in a microcosm. Why would such elaborate caves be carved out if there was nothing around it? Nobody seems to be bothered to find out. Everybody studies the caves and then moves on. There are caves in Borivli. There are caves at other places in Bombay. There are caves on the island of Elephanta. And as I said, there are more caves than we know what to do with. So we decided to pick Salset because we thought that Salset was still not completely built up. We said we wouldn't look at that which had already been done. We would try our best to zero in only on new finds. We split Salset into five zones. Andheri Marol Pawai, Thane City and its environs, Dara Bandra Santa Cruz Ville Parle, Gorai Manori Marve, Borivli, Kandivli, Goregao, and Mira Road, which I actually think is quite unfair to Dr. Abhijit Dandekar, who's here, but he didn't realize at that time how big his area was. And Vinayak took Bandup, Mulun, Vikroli, Kanjurma, Gatkopar, Kurla, and Sayan, equally large, so I think <coughs> because Vinayak didn't complain, Abhijit didn't complain either. But, well, five of us came together to take charge of five teams and lead five teams into the project. Dr. Suraj Pandit of Sate College is the director, I'm the co-director. These are my colleagues who work with me. Uh, Dr. Prachi Moghe from the Bharti Vidya Bhavan, Dr. Abhijit Dandekar from the Deccan College, Pune, and Vinayak Parab, who's well editor of the Loka Prabha and uh, a master's in Buddhist studies, etc., etc., and very interested in the archaeology of the city, and has been with the department and constantly been helping us in various different ways. We chose these areas depending on each of our strengths. We knew that we would be looking at materials in each of these areas that was different. For example, we knew, as a matter of fact, that the Bandra, Santa Cruz, Villa Parle, Dharavi region would essentially give us cultural data, which was oral traditions and such like. This was Dr. Moghe's forte, and that's why she was there. In Abhijit's area, we expected, we hoped to find a lot of ceramics and things like that because the area is still quite undisturbed, relatively, of course. So that was Abhijit's area. I took Thane because I'm just lazy. Okay? And... Uh, Vinayak poor guy was stuck with the rest of it. Suraj had already been doing work in Marol, so he took up Marol and that area around it. This is an early medieval Gajalakshmi image. A very, very interesting image on which perhaps Dr. Dandekar will one day come and enlighten you all because there's some fascinating stuff that needs to be done. Two elephants pouring two kalashas of water on a female image, normally holding different astras in our hands. Uh, right from the perhaps pre-Shilara period onwards, we see this kind of image 
scattered across the length and breadth of Maharashtra, cowed into individual slabs, cowed into temples, cowed into rocks, etc., etc. This one is being worshipped as a local mother goddess next to the Kundivite caves, that's the Mahakali caves. These are two shivlings at Mahakali. Both of them are actually votive stupas, Buddhist stupas of the 6th to 8th century AD and are presently repurposed and being worshipped. Now, so this is something that continues. So the sanctity of an object continues to remain even when the worshippers and the followers of those cults no longer are in the vicinity. This is, we really don't know, it's been nicely cemented on top and a lot of cement work on the sides, but definitely an earlier period image. We're not very sure what it is at Ganeshwadi. This is perhaps the most interesting. This is Kamala Mata. Please note her beard. <laughs> hey, come on, you heard of the bearded lady, right? So this is Kamala Mata with a beautiful beard and is actually a pillar fragment from what would have been an incredibly elaborate temple of perhaps the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries AD. And it's beautifully, uh, this is not Sindur, this is lovely oil paint. <laughs> Right, so she's been oil painted, two lovely glass eyes have been fixed into him and this is evidence that, f that in India sex change operations have been performed in much earlier times. Perhaps no hormone replacement therapy, therefore the uh, beard. So, I'm an equal opportunities abuser of everybody. So this is Mulgao Dongri and there is a beautiful inscription neatly embedded in this beautiful tree over here. You can see the sun and the moon and there are actually a few letters barely visible. There are two Kichakas from two different temples. This is the Mulgaon Dongri inscription. You can see a few alphabets over here. Sadly, this entire inscription has been cemented into place along with the tree. So short of hacking of the tree, there's no real taking out of this inscription. This is one of the Bharvakas, Bharvaka fragments from Mulgaon Dongri. This is a whole set, this is another Bharvaka over here and various different memorial stones and other stones, votive stones that have been gathered together neatly to form a shrine at Maheshwar Nagar near Marol. This is the Marol police camp. At some point in the late Srilahara Yadava period, there was a fabulous temple at Marol. The remains of which are still lying scattered in the backyard of the police lines. This is from Adarsh Nagar and this stone has a very, very interesting story. Now the Gaivasru stone or sometimes called the Savat uh, Sadenu, uh, I don't see why this is necessarily a Savat Sadenu. Very often the Savat is separate from the Denu. Okay, so According to Mirashi, this is the physical embodiment of a land grant where the cow represents the grant, the calf represents the doni, the milk that he is drinking is the profit that he accrues from this grant given to him. And yes, we do see these stones attached to inscriptions bearing land grants. There's a famous one from Vasai by one of the Shilahara kings. This stone is actually new. There was an older one which completely wore away, according to the locals. So before they discarded the older stone, they reenacted a brand new stone and had one cowed out by a vadari to replace their old stone with. It's telling you about continuity of traditions. They might not remember any longer why this was there. But once these stones are erected, they gain a certain degree of sacredness, a certain degree of sanctity, and this sanctity continues. This is a beautiful Kichaka lying on its side. So this one should have been face down with a pillar under it and two beams extending on both sides of it. And has been beautifully dressed up in a sari. Lovely flowers, gorgeous paintwork. Is now worshipped as Hanuman. Uh, please don't miss the beautifully painted scroll work. And his lovely ornamentation. I picked Thane because I've had an enormous amount of interest in the Shilahara dynasty. I have worked with sites where they 
and their successors have had major influences. And we knew that Shri Sthanaka, as Thane was originally known, was one of the capitals of the Shilaharas. We expected to find some interesting data there. Some data was already known. But the whole of Thane is almost completely built up. Roads, buildings, colonies, etc. So the approach was different for Thane. Instead of a road by road, mohalla by mohalla approach, what we were going to do was we were going to zero in on the lakes of Thane, which regularly when they're desilted, bring up broken images of statuary belonging to various different periods because it is a tradition to immerse broken and worn statues into the waters. Visarjan, which we just did for old G.B. Maurya a few days back, <laughs> last of the Mauryas. So, um, uh, yeah, my favorite Hindu deity. <laughs> hmm. For years, me and Abhijit were actually in charge of the Deccan College Ganpati and uh, he would come on a scooter and the first year he went on a scooter because he couldn't afford anything else. And for many years after that, I was in charge of his Hadgadi, of his Visarjan, etc. Abhijit was also our Pandit. Basically, he was a student and his services were free. <laughs> so, uh, we zeroed in on the lakes and we realized that adjacent to the lakes are always a number of temples because places that yield water are equally sacred. The lakes of Thane are man-made. One of the epithets of Thane city was the city of lakes. There were supposedly over 30 lakes that had been created, lakes or ponds that had been created in Thane. Each of them to ensure its sanctity and to make sure it was not misused and to make sure that the waters were more or less equally distributed would, would belong by default to a temple. These temples continue to exist at most of these locations and as and when something turns up in the vicinity that has sanctity or looks sacred because you don't want to upset the gods, you take it to the nearest temple that you can find and quietly leave it behind and say, sorry God, we moved you but we give you respect and you put you at a temple and please don't be bad to us and you know, don't curdle the milk and do things like that, right? So, this is a beautiful Ganesha image which is enshrined in a small temple at Gautam Labdi in the Charai region of Tane. These all belong to the Amruteshwar Mahadev temple at the Amruteshwar lake in Tane. There's a beautiful Shaivite Kichaka with Jata's gorgeous jewelry, fragments, cultural fragments, more sculptural and structural fragments. So it's a beautiful Bhairava image. Uh, when we went the first time, it was unadorned by color. It is now a beautiful silver and gold painted image. Uh, various different images, a more modern, more recent uh, protector deity image, an upper fragment of a hero stone were all found scattered at the back of the temple. This is the Gaudevi Mandir in Thane. And what's actually important is this over here. This is the Kuta Shikara, part of the Shikara of a temple, which is made up of smaller Shikaras mounted up in kind of descending order, which tells us once again that there was this kind of an image, this kind of a fragment, which means there was this kind of a temple somewhere in the vicinity. And we also have, interestingly, a very late local memorial stone outside. These kind of memorial stones exist at a number of places in Thane and Vikroli. And if there is some enterprising student who would like to work on them, they can do so. In fact, one of them is at the archives, the Godrej archives, one or two of them where uh, Vishaka used to work. This is the Ghantali temple or the Ghantali Devi Mandir in Thane. Completely new, cement concrete, with the exception of this. The base to the entrance of the Garbhagriha which is part of the doorway, belongs to the original temple or is rather all that is left of an earlier shrine at this location. This is the Ghorbandar Fort and there are some interesting iron pipes which you haven't understood embedded there, a number of them. Some late blue and white pottery of the Portuguese period. Beautiful Devi image that was recovered recently from there. These, alas, are a whole series of beautiful sculptural and structural members for which we have no provenance. Local gentleman, Mr. Bedekar, collected a lot of these 
in his lifetime and donated them to this college, which has neatly preserved them in its garden at the back. But nobody knows where any of them are from. And Mr. Bedekar also collected a lot of material from other places, which we know of. And therefore, giving this local provenance is difficult. But these later medieval pillar bases of the wooden wadas are very, very interesting. These are the stone bases on which the wooden members, the wooden pillar members used to stand. And you will still find a number of them littering the alleys of Thani, where houses are being renovated and nobody knows what to do with these. So enterprising architects here, take a truck down, collect them, pack them up and save them. Please geotag them too. This was across the highway in what we call the tribal region. So we wanted to sample this area. And there is the remnants of a hero stone. And this actually is a base of a pillar. And both of them are now being worshipped as separate deities. This is Udik Dev and this is Brahmi Dev. We have, I have never come across a Brahmi Dev before or really an Udik Dev, but that's my failing and not anybody else's. But they are very interesting deities that have been created by the local uh, autochthonous peoples. This is the Kopri meat bandar. There used to be a railway line that ran here and salt would come in in barges over here and be collected here. And the entire bandar is ringed with cannon. So these cannon, when they were defunct, were used as bollards, you know, they were put in so that you could moor your ships to them. They became so popular all over Europe and over Asia that subsequently when new bollards were made, they were shaped like cannon. <laughs> Not functional cannon, bollards. But they were shaped like this because this was now the design. Okay? So this one is on its, on its way to deification. <laughs> because the local temple has encroached outwards and has encompassed this and now recently painted this and we are sure that in a few well months there will probably be a couple of eyes and a mouth and <laughs> no no don't love there is there is actually there are actually entire european canons which are worshipped as devis <laughs> at a number of places in india so the human mind is so beautifully ingenious i mean look this is the country that gave the world bollywood we make more movies than the rest of the world put together. This is, this is the country in which one of its greatest heroes, or superheroes if you want to call him, can take shelter when he's being shot behind a cycle. <laughs> Where when three bad guys are coming to kill the good guy, one of them has a gun and the hero has only a knife, he flings his knife at the gunman in the center, who opens fire, the bullet splits into two, kills the two guys on each side, and the knife goes on to kill him. If Rajini can't, then who can? <laughs> so, this is the Kopineshwar temple, a temple built by the Marathas very specifically after they had liberated Thane from the Portuguese. And there is a very beautiful Chaturmukha Linga of Kopineshwar. There's some very interesting later, very tribalish looking Vishnu image. Fragment of an earlier temple here with a Vinadhara. Uh, this is just a Masoba image. Two beautiful Shilahara style pillars. Fragments of which which are being used as a bench. <laughs> okay. A much later period. Uh, Deepmala. And this beautiful cowed fragment. Which was bought by a local restauranter. From the laborers digging the foundations next door to him. And as he proudly told me, I paid 2000 rupees for this. Because you know, it is a good looking shopis. So this Shopis is now adorning the steps to XYZ Upahar Graha in um, this thing. XYZ because I can't remember where it is. Vishakal will probably tell you. Where. What? Kuti Rudyog, sorry. Kuti Rudyog Thani. This is the police lines. And we've gone back here and got some more spectacular results this year. But we got the usual Bharvakas, a bottom part of a sculpture. A beautiful head over here. This was most interesting. This is part of the lintel of a Jain temple dating back again to the early medieval period. When we inquired with the local Jains, they were very constant in their reply to us that the Jains have only been in Thane for the last 150 years. This tells us that the Jains, who were master traders, 
were definitely here during the heyday of Thane. And perhaps due to persecutions or whatever, they had left Thane and have made a comeback recently. This is the Siddeshwar temple at Siddeshwar Lake, the site of the famous Siddeshwar Brahma image, which is a man-sized, full-size Brahma image. Uh, there's a, sadly, there is now a replica of that outside the town hall at Thane, and everybody thinks that the replica is the original. More glory to Brahma. Okay, these are a scattering of the images that have been recovered from there. Some of them beautiful Vishnu images over here. This one has various different Dashavatara avatars over here and other things in the Prabhavali. And this one is damaged. Like one of these days I'm going to go and put this in a haversack and run away with it. There's a beautiful image over here, and I'm not really very sure what I'm looking at here. And uh, well, there's another Vishnu image over here. So images from different periods showing different styles, all collected from the same lake and quietly resting behind one temple in Thane. This is all early medieval data. This is a completely unknown statue from Dharavi. This is a beautiful hero stone which was collected by the seashore near Chuim village by Mr. Vikram Rao. When he was 14, he didn't know what it was. He dragged it all the way to his father's garage and kept it there for many years and showed it to us later. This is a very interesting plaque with a chalice, which is almost completely buried now as the road has climbed up over the years near St. Anne's Convent at Chimbal. And it's part of an earlier wall that existed there. What's a hero stone? A hero stone essentially is a memorial stone erected in the memory of somebody who has died a heroic death. Like, you know, like we make a memorial today to our heroes who have died. Okay, so essentially the bottom scene shows the hero over here being killed. So this is normally what is called the death scene. Usually above that is the hero ascending towards heaven and there, is, there are normally three panels and the third panel the hero is shown usually in front of a shivlinga saying that he has reached Kailash and has reached heaven. There are various interpretations for the central panels, etc., etc. Um, is there anything to say that the person killing the other person is not the hero? It's just interpretation. He's alive. Why would you make a memorial to him? <laughs> <laughs> you don't. You don't. So, luckily for us, all over Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, we have inscriptions telling us about how the hero has died a terrifically heroic death and how has ascended completely to the heavens and is now reunited. So we very often have his wife committing or wives committing sati along with him and how they are all one big happy family up in heaven. <laughs> so how do you so, interpret that the hero died? He's giving it to him. Some of them are even more graphic. There are, there are even instances of the hero holding up his hair and cutting off his head. <laughs> and there are various different interpretations. Maybe Kushru will ask Dr. Dandekar to come and speak to you all about the various different kinds of memorial stones that dot the landscape. There are thousands of them in Maharashtra. Thousands upon thousands of them. Some are even carved into earlier caves. Buddhist caves. So they're very, very interesting. Uh, testaments of the common people. The common people who were the cannon fodder of the armies of the medieval period. So, this is a really interesting place in Juhu that belonged to a local gentleman who had created a little local museum for himself and collected all kinds of different memorabilia and then he promptly died and his children really have no clue whereabouts in Juhu he collected all these things from. So this is a beautiful Vishnu and Lakshmi image. This is Mr. Vishnu. That's Lakshmi on his lap. And we know that it is Vishnu because there is Garuda sitting over here with his beak slightly broken off, folded hands and what's left of his wings. So we know who it is. And part of a Prabhavali of a larger image, part of a temple, pillar base of the later medieval or colonial period, more sculptural material, very badly damaged hero stone fragments, a sati stone. Please note the arm over here. 
So the arm like this, at a right angle. Can you see the arm? So this is the hand of the sati, the right hand, raised up. So this is the symbol of the sati. This would also have multiple panels, so on and so forth. You have a beautiful goddess image over here, more images over here, and a nandi over here. A kichaka, four kichaka, four probably, with a central pillar, would have been a gajalakshmi image over here. The ceiling of a very elaborate temple, a ceiling fragment, a pillar fragment, telling us that there was probably, in the late Shilahara Yadava period, a very, very elaborate temple at Juhu. This is one of the earliest surviving wells of Juhu, which has a beautiful inscriptional panel and a lovely early cross inside it. And uh, when this was renovated, perhaps in 1853, which you see the date over here, very difficult to photograph, very odd angle. And we can't really ask our students to suspend themselves into the well. I mean, there's a lot of things we do for archaeology, but there are limits. So this is the Gorai, Manori, Marwe, Borivli, Kandivli, Gore, Kaumira Road. Uh, as I said, we were really mean to poor Dr. Dandekar. So very, very interesting pair of images carved in a large boulder at Gorai village and then subsequently hacked out. Interestingly, the lotus base of the image has survived. I can vaguely see there was some kind of humaniform image over here and another one over here, perhaps two legs, skirt over here, torso over here, head over here. And for whatever reason, these images have been damaged, but there is enough evidence that they're still there. This is one of the Gaiwasru, original Gaiwasru pillars, <coughs> which was found over there. This is the Harsiddhi Mata temple near Tata Power in Burivli East. And in the compound, like I told you, various things end up in the compound surreptitiously kept under trees. There's a beautiful Ganesha image here. Some kind of a structural fragment, more structural fragments with sculptures on them. This was actually found during the boring work that was being done for the various uh, metro lines that are being laid in Bombay. And this was lying on a pile of debris that had been cored out of the ground. We're not really very sure as to its antiquity. It is definitely some kind of a goddess image, very beautifully done in the front, very, ba very basic in its back, telling us it must have probably been worshipped in a niche or with its back to a wall. But whether it is, well, I would personally think it's kind of modern, but, uh, well. Looks brand new. Uh, yeah, but some of these things can surprise the hell out of you. So this is the Vairala Talao. And there are some very, very interesting walls of the Portuguese period, which are still extant around it. So these are the retaining walls of a man-made lake. And they're almost gone. This is the beauteous structure that has been made by the BMC. And has, I have no idea what it's quite doing here, but well. So these are other structures on the periphery. An interesting, uh, well, cylindrical structures that extend outwards to support the wall. I'm sure our architect friends will be able to give us more technical names for it. Whole series of collapsed ruins above this place and the back wall of what looks like a classic Portuguese church structure. This is, these are the ruins about the Mandapeshwar caves or what was called Mount Pezier or Mount Poissur at one time and there was a working uh, monastery. The monastery also included the caves underneath and a couple of uh, very interesting icons in the caves were converted into a cross etc, etc. The Archaeological Survey of India has done some conservation work and that's why some parts of it are still intact, some parts of it are not very intact. This is a very, very interesting, very rare kind of cannon which we found buried at Manori. Now, uh, we had a lot of problems. I don't know if I told you, but each of us who worked in the field had three students actually working under us, doing the work. Uh, most of us were very lucky. Abhijit had only one student ultimately working under him, Bhakti, and she did some phenomenal work on her own because the other two tended to not be there most of the time, sadly. 
We went back this year and we've actually found the twin of this cannon about 20 feet away from it. And it's buried up till here. <coughs> Somewhere here, in the back over here. And uh, we are asking the State Department of Archaeology whether they will retrieve this cannon and maybe put them up at the East Indian Museum. This attachment over here to swivel the cannon around, this is where the firing port of the cannon is. So this kind of a looped attachment is not very commonly seen. What is it made of? Iron. These are the typical cast iron cannon of the European. No, this is probably a British cannon. We'll see when we take it out if there's anything on it. Sadly, very often there is nothing on them. Sometimes you're incredibly lucky and there are things on them. But they don't really mean much. Most of the uh, Sultanate powers, Shivaji himself and others would buy cannons from the Europeans. Shivaji did not really make any cannons of his own. He bought cannons. He didn't really use a lot of cannons. In the terrain that he was, they were not of much use. They were mainly mounted on his fortresses. Uh, but we do know when we go further south and we look at the Ahmed Shahi and the Nizam Shahi uh, forts, that there are often very interesting European cannon there. In fact, there is one place in Maharashtra where there is a beautiful Spanish cannon. Now, a Portuguese cannon or a British cannon, I can understand. But there is a beautiful brass Spanish cannon with the Spanish royal crest upon it. So it's telling us that this cannon was probably captured and then traded subsequently. So we know that there were a lot of Dutch and Flemish traders in this area trading cannons to the Indian potentates. Because A, it's on somebody's property, B, it is an artifact, and you can't just willy-nilly dig up artifacts on the ground and take them away when you want to. There are laws about this. The ASI can virtually do anything. Of course, prop the ASI is the authority. They declare this a object of value to the nation, and they, well, give you a letter saying thank you very much for it and take them away. Oh, it's difficult. They can, they normally don't or won't. Also, uh, there are incredible political ramifications to things like this. So it's always nicer to have the government directly intercede instead of interceding on our own. Though technically, these are all explorations that have been done with prior permission from the Archaeological Survey of India, and we could be the recipients of this kind of material. And that would be completely legal, but we would have to be recipients of this material which means whoever owns. So these two cannon for ma that ex matter are actually sitting on a property that's disputed. It's not owned by the people who claim to own it. And it's definitely not owned by the people who live there. Who are living in one fifth of the entire massive wada that exists. And this is in their foreground, which has partially been encroached by a local fellow who does welding work and who's got his tin shed welding things. So, who do we ask the permission of to take these things out? Not to mention, it doesn't look like much, but there's about five, four or five times more buried into the ground. So, it's a deep hole to make. And it's not just going to come out by itself. It's going to need earth-moving equipment. We're probably going to have to call a JCB to manhandle it out and so on and so forth. So, it's not that easy to do, you know. There's a lot of stuff we'd love to do. The university has plenty of place to mount these objects and to give them a good home. We could do conservation work on them. We could teach our students with them, so on and so forth. But various different agencies need to come together to do this. The State Department of Archaeology and Museums Maharashtra did not have an archaeologist at its helm for the last 20 years. We had very nice people, but they were not archaeologists. Half of them were on punishment postings. Yeah, that's what the government does. It sends its administrators to places like this to punish them. So the morale of the entire department was not really very high. We finally got a very good archaeologist as the State Department director. But it's going to take him time just to find out what he has, what he is capable of doing, what he can do, what he can't do, so on and so forth. And ultimately, he is a government servant. He has to do things only with the say-so of the government. So it's a very difficult situation to be in, you know. 
Sometimes we sit at home and it's pretty easy to stand in judgment on people who work for the government. It's, it's a thankless job. These are two of the seven hero stones of the village of Iksar near Borivli. When I first saw them, they were about 100 meters away from the road on a low mound. There was nothing on any side of them. Today they are behind a huge high-rise building. Behind locked doors, private locked doors. And they have been embedded in... What is this thing? They have been embedded in cement. And can you see this? There is this beautiful tile work all around them. And they are now being worshipped as Sat Asra and Sateri Ai and so on and so forth. These are the most fabulous, fantastic, amazingly cowed hero stones in the whole of Maharashtra. Archaeologists believe that they represent the defeat of the Shilaharas by the Chalukyas in a battle in the 13th century AD. Sorry, the Yadavas. Okay. And you have amazing scenes of elephant warfare over here before the king actually ascends. And all kinds of elaborate scenes. His actual dead body being, you know, disposed of over here. There are even two of them which show you a naval battle in progress with beautiful multi oared ships. They are an absolutely unique repository of the history of Maharashtra. And most Maharashtrians haven't the faintest clue about them and today can't even go to them. So our students were actually told they couldn't go to see them. Dr. Dandekar happened to be there that day and actually threatened the fellow and said, I'll have you locked up for stopping me from getting excess. I have government permission to do so. So then it was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so thoda sa hul diya na. You know how it is. So, Mulun Bandup, Kanjurmag, Vikroli, Ghatkobar, Kurla and Sayan. So apart from Kurla Sayan, the rest of the area was essentially not really developed till the last century. So we didn't know what we would really find here. Most of these areas like Vikroli, Ghatkopar and Kanjurmag were tribal territories. A large amount of it is in public hands today, like the Godrej Foundation, you know, they have an enormous amount of space. When they bought it, the people laughed at them and said, what an idiot buying land in Vikroli. Today he's laughing, his sons are laughing at everybody. Okay, so this is the Bhandupeshwar temple. There's some interesting icons over there. <coughs> and it's a very modern temple. There are very, very interesting local protective, protector deities, Gorab Dev, Shitrapals. Okay, this is the Shitrapal of Bhandup. They normally mark the outer precincts of various different important regions and areas, villages and so on. This was the most fabulous find. This is a very interesting single paneled hero stone. The hero is shown with a bow and arrow. This is a land grant charter with a moon and a sun, probably under all this paint and sindur, an inscription, we hope, and a gadegal depiction at the bottom, and are worshipped as a dev and a devi. Thanks to which they're still intact and still there. So let's look at the bright side of things, guys. Okay? So we hope that once we've gained enough confidence of the locals, they will allow us to clean them up a little bit and perhaps at least record them once before they repaint them. This is Tungavateshwar Mandir and this is Tungya. He's actually called Tungya. Tungavateshwar is absolutely brand new modern, modern Sanskritization of a local Shetrapal with his lantern and his kati. This itself is a modern representation of Tungya. Various interesting, this is Sati Devi, a rock with a hole in it, probably a door jamb from the medieval period. <laughs> this is Hanuman, don't ask me how. <laughs> okay, this is various Sati Devis over here. And this is, this one image is called Chausat Yogini. Ek Yogini Chausat Ke Barabar. Ek Maratha Lak Maratha. Then why not one Devi Chausat Devi? This is a structural fragment of a temple, both of these, which have been covered in enough Sindur to make them completely amorphous and are being worshipped as various different deities. Thanks to my good friend Sardar Tarasingh, who has paid for the temple 
and gets votes in exchange. This is the Narba Devi temple, which is the local goddess. And this is Shitla Devi and Annapurna Devi. See the interesting juxtaposition of Shitla and Annapurna. Annapurna is the one who gives, and this is Shitla who takes. So you got to make her happy all the time, because if she ain't happy, then you get smallpox, chicken pox, measles, so on and so forth, because you've been a bad boy. And an architectural fragment lying there, for some reason locally called the Deep Mala. We couldn't quite figure out why. This is Taramati, okay? And this is where the Tulsi Lake can be seen from Taramati. And this is the Taramati Devi. And this is the back of the Kaneri Caves. From here is the route to Kaneri Caves, the old route. Not the new route, which is through the Borivli region, which is the modern route. And uh, we are wondering, just wondering, whether the word Taramati is a remnant, a hangover of the goddess Tara of the Buddhists. Because this is not a very common name for deities in this area of Maharashtra. This is the Vikroli Masoba. I love his mustachios. Mooch ho to Vikroli ke Masoba jaisi. Nahi to na ho. That's why most of the other Masobas don't have a mooch. They decide to shave theirs off when they saw his beautiful mooch. Look at that schnoz. And this is Jagdamba Mata's head. This is the Masoba, by the way, he's just this big. Are these also appropriated? No, these are various local folk deities who have today become more and more and more important. This is the Kirol Gau Devi. We don't really know why four of them have one name. But if one of them can be Chausat Yogini, then four of them can have one name. <laughs> right? This is at Sion, and there used to be a small cave over here. But it was damn difficult to keep getting into the cave. So at some point, they chopped off the top of the cave and they built a temple on top of it. So this is Lada Devi, Shitla Devi and Nama Devi who are the triumvirate who are worshipped in the Gaudevi Devi, Shitla Devi temple at Sion. And this is a 360 view of the inside of what used to be a cave. And this is a beautiful silver mask Ganpati which is placed there today. Beautiful bathroom tiles all over the place. <laughs> This is Mutimsar Baba, a local deity from Sahan Koliwada. This is his modern Rupa. Please note the interesting Chetrapal imagery of the lamp and the stick. A guardian deity. This is a drawing of Mutimsar Baba and this is what the original icon looked like, which has since been given a visarjan when this icon was made. This is a bizarre Hanuman image, which may be a Kanfata Jogi of the Nath Pandi, according to Dr. Jamkedkar. This is Mukta Devi temple. And these are various different stones, just stones, which are worshipped over there. This is the basement of a house in Chafe Gali at Chunabati. And in the basement of the house are the remains of a small rock-cut cave with these niches and this very, very badly damaged image over here. There's a close-up of the image but there's nothing that you can really make out from it. When they were renovating the house, they found this, well, little rock cut cave at the base. So they sealed it off with a doorway and the local family has put a light over there and they maintain it carefully with due respect. Now they could have filled this up with cement, but they didn't and we're pretty grateful to them for not doing so. This is the Padmavati temple at Pawai and this is the famous Pawai inscription uh, well, which actually needs to be completely reworked considering some of the discoveries that we have made in the recent past. These are some other, this is a twin caduceus like Nagoba from Mahakali. And Mahakali, this Mahakali temple is at Pawai, huh, by the way, not at Mahakali. This is very similar to what I showed you from Thane and which is also there from Vikroli. These are both memorial stones. This is Vagoba the Gaon Devi and this is Ghodaya Varchi Devi because there is a horse. Let's be simple about it. This is what I love about folk, folk goddesses. Folk goddesses do not have unnecessarily elaborate stories. They are very simple. Cut and dried. And in this you can see the difference between the folk deities of the tribals, the folk deities of the settled people and the deities of the more urbanized, sanskritized people. 
To give you an example, at Verli, there used to be an incredibly famous Devi temple of the Kolis. Now, the Koli deities are not sweet, loving, kind deities. There are all, they are all deities which need to be appeased at all times. The Koli goddesses are vicious and can take umbrage and insult at the drop of a fish. Okay? So when a Koli Tandel, who runs a ship, comes across a really huge catch, the first thing he does once his catch is sold is he races for his family shrine with a bottle of alcohol, a chicken and money. Places the money at the temple, pours a little bit of the alcohol, sacrifices the chicken there, thanks the goddess for showing him favor, out of turn. So grateful to you. Thank you very much. Here's your share. Please don't get pissed off. Please continue to be happy with me. Thank you very much. Then he's like, okay, now I can spend my money. Right? So they are called the Nausachi Devis and various other names like this are given to them. So the local people, especially the Marwadis, started worshipping at this temple. And very soon the temple became beautifully elaborate, covered in bathroom tiles. They imported a priest and said this was a Lakshmi temple. And the Kolis, whose temple it was, packed their bags and left. And they just stopped going there. And when they were told, but it's your Devi here. They said, nope. We don't understand this Annapurna Devi who's just giving and giving and giving. Why is she giving? <laughs> what kind of goddess just gives? Something very fishy over here. This is not our Devi. Our Devi obviously <laughs> packed her bags and left. So we are also leaving. No nonsense about us. You all take it. Obviously somebody else's Devi has moved in here. So this is one of the most amazing Gadegals that we have found. Again, rather graphic. So I apologize if there are people under the age of 18 in the audience. Uh, but, well, part of your history. <laughs> so this was buried like this. Okay, all this was buried. Under the ground. This was all that was visible. And was worshipped as Devi or Varaha or something or the other. And was embedded under a tree. You can see the back of the tree with the Vatapurnima threads around it. And by then, our students who had been working were bloody good at seeing things from the corner of their eyes. Now, we taught them this, that peripheral vision is a huge thing. You know, like Trump says, huge. Yeah. It's huge. Why does he do this? Because he can see his hands in his peripheral vision. Right? So, they were going home. It was twilight. And one of them said, hey, you get it. So the girls zoomed over there and asked the pujari who said, Deva sa dagada hai. They said, really? Stick in a travel, move a brush. So said, what's your dev doing? <laughs> the poor pujari was absolutely gobsmacked. All these years he had been offering puja to this Ashli image. He, he needed to go to Kailash and beg forgiveness and whatever. So, the next day, the team leader for the area, Vinayak, turned up there, thank God in the nick of time, the entire stone had been uprooted and packed up in a red cloth and was about to be thrown into the Pavai Lake. So Vinayak had to threaten them with police action, then we had to find out who owned the temple. We met the trustees of the temple, who were really nice people, who said we had no clue what was happening. The priest said there is some Ashleel stone, we need to research on it. So he said, okay, do it. I mean, now that you've told us how important it is, don't you worry. We'll take care of it. So we're going to hopefully make them a plaque or give them the stuff to put in a plaque so that they can put it up. And we'd like it to be preserved where it is. Now, this family owned all of Chandivli. They bought it in the 1940s. 44 acres of Chandivli. Okay? This is perhaps the actual deed to that plot of land which has passed down generation after generation after generation till the ancestors of Mr. Shet bought the same plot of land. Ah, there's a lot of Sindhur on it. <laughs> We've uh, been working on it. It's actually in our custody at the moment. We're trying to clean it up. We're hoping for the Sindhur to dry a bit because uh, it gets slapped on every year and you can't quite peel it off. 
because uh, very often the inscription peels off with it. So uh, we've got Rajesh Pujari from the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale, which is essentially the Prince of Wales Museum of Western India. And he's keeping an eye on things and we hope to get things done. And we had this uh, at our annual exhibition that we do in December, January every year and about 20,000 odd people saw it. This is Paspoli Gaon, uh, very modern images with some earlier images. Please note the <coughs> God with the elbows, which is actually, as I said, again, a local folk memorial stone. Two stone slabs that are the Gao Devi at Are. And this. This is the Gao Devi at Gao Devi Pada at Are Goregaon. And what's amazing about this is this is a natural geological phenomena of columnar basalt protruding out from the ground, which is worshipped as a goddess. This is one of the rare cases of a geological phenomena being worshipped. This is the Holy Trinity Church and various different parts of it. This is Portuguese. Uh, year before last, you remember there was a bit of a drought before the rains and uh, the lake had really shrunk. So we were looking at the borders of the lake and we found some beautiful microlithic tools and a lovely little thumbnail scraper over there. And then this. So as part of what we were doing, we were asking anybody and everybody we could for, do you know of anything in your region and do you know of anything in your region? And from Devnar, from the BARC, we have the chief horticulturist who teaches at our department. We also have a course in gardening that we do and landscaping. So he said, ah, oh, when we were working, we found a couple of things. I'll send you some pictures. So he sent my director a couple of images. The first would have been phenomenal by itself, which was a beautiful Kutashikara in Gujarat sandstone. It shouldn't be in Devnar. But we kind of put it on the back burner just now because what came with it was this. This is an inscription from 1290 Shaka, 1368 AD. It is the only inscription from Bombay of that decade and the decade before it and the decade after it and perhaps another couple of decades in every direction. And sadly, of course, you know, all good things have to come to an end. The damn thing is broken. And this is barely the first, so it extends till about here, okay, like this. And we barely got the top half of the inscription. But what we've got is absolutely phenomenal. This is the date of 1290 that you see. Can you read it? Yes. It's in Devanagari, or Nagri rather. And it says that on the so-and-so day of the Hijri year so-and-so, the Shalivana Shaka, uh, 1290 blah, 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 on the 10th moon of Ravi Ulawal, which is the Hijri month and day, on the so-and-so day of the Kilaka Samvatsara, which is the cyclical year, Monday, Sultan Peroj Shah, Dili Rajyam Karoti, when Sultan Feroz Shah Tughlaq was ruling from Delhi, his vassal, Tatapada Padmopajivi, who growls beneath the lotus feet of the emperor. Maharaja Dhiraja, Shri Hambir Rao. Okay, that's Hambir Rao here. Hamabir Rao. Thane Kunkana was ruling over Thane Konkan, which is the northern half of Konkan, from Mahim Bimbasthani. Now, Bimbasthan or Mahim Bimbasthan has been referred to in a lot of textual documents of a much later period, which have been looked at skeptically by most historians because these texts are quite recent and quite badly disordered and talk about a local dynasty in Bombay formed by one mythical king called Bimba and the Pathari Prabhus of Bombay claim to be the well, descendants of King Bimba and his vassals who came down with him and of course they take their story behind and say when love and Kush went south and went east and west and the followers of love went through uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat and ultimately ended up in Bombay and they are the 
Vamsaj of Rama. But what was really interesting was nobody had ever talked about Mahim Bimbastani in an inscription before. And we really didn't have any medieval data saying that it was such. And we now knew that Thane Kunkana, which is referred to Thane Kunkan, Thane Kukan, which Ibn Battuta, Ibn Battuta calls it, same name that our good friend uh, Marco Polo gives it when he goes to Thane and says it's the capital of the Thane Kunkan region, and they call it Tana, Kung, Tana Kukan, okay, is this area of northern Raigad and the coast at Thane was being ruled from Mahim in Bombay, which is a beautiful island city. And his uh, prime minister gave this bakashi. It's a very interesting Arabic word being used over here, Persia, Persia Arabic word being used, has given a gift to this man called Commander Dasun for his services. And he has been given a village, sadly, which is bloody chopped off here. Okay. In the region of Nanole, a village called Nanole Gramu 1. And this is Nanole, which used to be in what is now the BRC territory. So we know from the records that there was actually a village called Nanole. And then goes on to tell us that various different people were witness to this. And since the people's names are the names of the villages that they came from, these important people, we have the names of a large number of places in Bombay. So there is a Devnara Karu telling us that the village of Devnar is at least as old as 1290 Shaka. Sahara Karu, the village of Sahar. Dethan Karu, now we don't know where this village called Dethan is and we're looking for it. And a large number of Mataras, okay, who are elders from various different places. And it goes on to tell us in graphic detail who these various people were. What is fascinating is Hambir Rao we know from at least two more inscriptions. One from Nagao near Alibag and one from Ranward, uh, Ranward near Uran. But we didn't know that he was also ruling over Bombay. We knew he was ruling over the adjacent mainland. We now know that in 1368 AD, this area along with in 1367, and 1366, the other areas, so from 1366 to 1368 for sure, this was the domain of Hambir Rao. In the other two inscriptions, interestingly, Hambir Rao talks about himself as an independent king. And here, in his last inscription, he suddenly gets incredibly pious. Now, the history of Bombay has huge holes in it. One of the biggest holes has been that in 310 AD, Mubarak Shah, the son of Alauddin Khilji took over the rule of this region, blah, blah, blah. And then in 1348, it became part of the domains of the Gujarat Sultans. Now this problem of this 1348 date is that this is cut pasted from a book by a gentleman called S.M. Edwards, who was writing in 1909 and made a mistake. Everybody else uses this same data, most of the time without giving any reference to Mr. Edwards, as though this is their own research and they are absolutely confident of it, without seeming to realize that the Gujarat Sultans didn't start ruling till the 15th century AD. <laughs> so, excuse me? What Gujarat Sultans? There weren't any Gujarat Sultans at that time. This was part of the, the domains of the Tughlaqs. In 1366, Ferocia Tughlaq went on his ill-fated campaign to Sindh, to Thatta, got his backside kicked and retreated to Gujarat and basically picked up his local governor and bitch slapped him to say where the hell were my supplies, where the hell was my backup, where the hell were you? And he stayed in Gujarat and consolidated his forces to attack Tata once again in 1367-1368. So he was consolidating, so he was obviously consolidating his rule over the local vassals who had grown a little too big for their britches. Namely, one Mr. Hambir Rao was obviously told in no uncertain terms that he was not Pauda Pratapa Chakravarti any longer, but Tatapada Padmopajivi. <laughs> and that he had to get in line. But what it interestingly tells us is that there was a local Hindu ruler ruling over the Bombay region during this period. It also establishes that to a large extent, this elusive Bimba and his dynasty probably now have real historicity. It also makes a case, though it's a very loose case, 
for the name of the city of Bombay, which the Pathari Prabhus have always said comes from the word Bimba. I'm not saying so. I'm just saying it makes an interesting case. Right? It also establishes the importance of Mahim. Now this taken with the stuff that we've been finding at Mahim in the last five years suddenly makes Mahim that much more important during the early medieval period. And it makes sense for why Magdumali Mahimi's Darga is at Mahim. Magdumali Mahimi was the first Indian to write an exegesis of the Quran. Uh, something you can't write today any longer. Times are not nice any longer. Uh, we are all religious fanatics in all our religions. Equal opportunities abuser. So, uh, he wrote this beautiful exegesis. His father had come down from Iraq as a teacher. And he was married himself, now in the 15th century, to the, daughter, to the sister of the Sultan of Gujarat, who was ruling over Mahim. Telling us about the importance of Mahim, why all these people from abroad were settled here by the things, telling us that Mahim was a huge important port site. I mean the port at Mahim is now completely covered up. It was not on the seaward side, it was on the landward side. But hints of that period are left to us and including that of the name of Bandra, which basically is a modern English corruption of the Portuguese Bandora, which itself is a corruption of the word Bandar which was essentially a port, a creek port. So this has been a complete game changer. We've spent a lot of hours racking our brains. It might look simple. It's bloody difficult to read. There are no full stops. The words don't begin or end. They just run one into the other. There are spelling mistakes. <laughs> then there are bits that are eroded. There are bits that just don't make any sense. So we've had some really wild times and we finally finished this at 2 a.m. one day when we were sitting deciphering it and we were all completely wasted. This is about this big. That's the scale on top. That's a ruler, a 12 inch ruler. So it's about two feet across and about three feet long on this side. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the Loft Black Swan for inviting me, the ASI for permission, the Sade College Institution, all my friends and colleagues, all our students who worked with us, so many and just too many to thank over here. But we've had over 50 of our students work with us. Thanks to this inscription, this year we included Devnar. And we actually are hoping on the 16th of September at our annual explorations workshop in Bombay to talk about the first Portuguese hero stone from Bombay. And that's probably going to upset a lot of people. Um, which I like to do. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, all my colleagues who made this feasible and finally the people of Mumbai, without whose help this really wouldn't have been possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>